tonight's thought. Exciting things are going down at the Piggly Wiggly these days. Now that the uh, machines have moved in. Or maybe not, I don't know. Yeah, before this uh, quarantine happened, and it became a really dangerous thing to go into a grocery store, the Piggly Wiggly down the street from me was undergoing these massive renovations. I've been going to the store for years, and it always been the same thing. Nice little neighborhood grocery store. That, that's what the Piggly Wiggly, I guess, is supposed to be. It's the uh, model of the quaint American corner market. Going back something like a hundred years in this country. Uh, I remember the, in that movie, The Shawshank Redemption, that was the uh, store where Morgan Freeman worked at the end of that movie. He worked in a Piggly Wiggly. And uh, I don't know what it was like at, at, at that time. I, I know that grocery stores in this country, you know, started out. They didn't trust you, I guess, to go pick up your own groceries, or maybe it was like a convenience thing, like self-service, you know, like uh, gas or something, full-service gas. But what they did is uh, you go in and you give them a list, and then they go uh, behind the counter and they get everything you need, and they put it together for you, and they just give it to you. And uh, that's what the Piggly Wiggly started as, but you know, now... Uh, Americans enjoy shopping. They enjoy uh, going to a crowded parking lot and going into a store and walking down these massive aisles in a windowless building all day long. The only other place I know you can do that is like in a casino. <laughs> they they have no windows either. You know. And the pig has always been th this place that I really don't like going to because it is always crowded I always go uh, after work at 5 o'clock 6 o'clock in the evening when it's super busy there's just this huge rush on you get all this stuff of course there's no windows you don't know if it's morning or night so you just buy stuff for both occasions I guess and uh, the worst thing is you go and stand in line and you're, you're there behind all these people of course there's an express line if you only want to get 10, item, 10 items or fewer. But that express line is uh, built back up, so there's people going all the way back to the uh, bread aisle just waiting for a human being to ring them up at the register, to check them. They're called checkers, right? Well, the Piggly Wiggly, in addition to putting in like a really kick-ass... Uh, beer bar where you can go and get you know beer on tap and renovating their deli and their wine section and making it a real upscale shopping experience because people like upscale things these days in 2020 they put in self-checkout lanes and I'm sure you're familiar with the self-checkout lane uh, there's no people working there it's just this uh, little machine and you have to go up to it and you have to scan the code on every item of merchandise on all the food and and uh, if the item doesn't have merchandise like an apple you have to look up the apple on the computer automated system and it's a pretty self-explanatory process but every time I go there whether it be in a Walmart or a Target or yeah the Piggly Wiggly uh, there's always somebody there who's monitoring the area like like uh, like a guard to make sure that everybody's uh, getting their issues, their needs met. And this person is always busy because there's always somebody who's having problems like the plastic on like uh, on a sleeve of bagels is all wrinkled up and won't scan or somebody look, you know, somebody if you buy alcohol, you, you might as well just not go in the self-checkout line because uh, you have to prove that you're over 21 with your identification with your driver's license and so you have to stand there and wait for somebody you might, you might as well just go through uh, a line with like a human person behind it they haven't invented that yet a way to uh, I guess scan your driver's license or something I guess they also have to look at your face to make sure that you're, you don't have a fake ID or anything 
Yeah, that makes sense. But they haven't invented that yet, a way for, uh, you know, to tell if we're of legal age or not. But there's always somebody uh, at, at these checkout lanes helping people. It just it doesn't seem like it's a real convenience, but I think it is. As you go there, there's usually a lane open, and it's not like people are going through there with just carts full of stuff. It's usually people express who just need to get in and get out pretty quickly, you know. And I and I have to say that exciting things are happening at the Piggly Wiggly down the street from where I live because uh, I have not waited in the line at all in the last three weeks since they've had this uh, self checkout line. It's been kind of a cool thing, but that doesn't mean it doesn't have problems. I feel bad for some of the people who use these things who are technologically illiterate, and there are a lot in this world that we live in where we rely so heavily on, on technology. There are just some people who can't move on. And I'm, I'm talking about old people, okay? And I'm not ageist or anything. Um, my, my parents are really keeping up with the times pretty famously, I actually think, better than me. Uh, you know, they've got Apple everything. I went over to uh, my parents' house the other day, and he was just uh, oozing over his new... Uh, earbuds that charge in the case he was so excited about that and i watched him there playing spotify off of his ipad listening to uh, the temptations with his new earbuds his new wireless earbuds he was so excited about it yeah some people are adapting to this others just simply aren't and this the other day i saw this woman who was just having a tough time adapting to this world where machines run everything and I'm sure you know this woman. Uh, she was, even if you don't, you know, she was standing there at the line and something was not scanning for her. And it was just going, burr, burr. finally, she got it to scan. I was standing there next to her, kind of waiting for her to, uh, to move on. And uh, once she got the thing scanned, the uh, machine started talking to her. Please deposit item in bagging area. Please deposit item in bagging area. You know, this thing, it's almost like if you don't, like, listen, if I go through and buy a sucker, I don't need to bag that sucker because I'm, I'm eating that sucker as soon as I leave the store. Okay, I don't need it to put it in a bag. But uh, there's this thing that uh, they have these, uh, I guess, computer chips below uh, the bagging area, below the metal of that little rack where all the uh, grocery bags are. And, uh, and you have to put it in the bag. Of course, there is a little tiny button in the top left corner of the screen that says skip bagging, but most people skip that. So they're left with this machine voice that just barks out uh, back out at them. Please deposit item in bagging area. And this woman was like, okay, okay. Nice old lady, looks like a piano teacher. She puts... The thing, I don't know what it is because I don't look at other people's groceries like you. <laughs> she puts the thing in the bag and she takes it out and the thing continues to bark at her. Please deposit item in bagging area. You know, it's like uh, the Ed 209 in RoboCop. <laughs> you have 30 seconds to comply. And she's starting to, you just get this like scene in her. And she's like turning all red. She's getting really angry. She's like, I put it in the bag. I put it in the bag. She, oh my gosh, she's, she's kind of freaking out here, talking to this machine who doesn't have a soul and can't reason with her and won't stop until she gets what she wants, until she is, has it bagged. <laughs> Started to quote the Terminator there for a minute, you know, but, so meanwhile, this uh, clerk who works the pig, you know, with the piggly wiggly smock over, uh, over her chest walks up to the woman and uh, she says, ma'am, I got it. I got it. And the woman like back away. <laughs> I got it bagged. <laughs> She's forgoing talking to like a reasonable, uh, logical human being to continue yelling at this machine. I, I can't fault her for that, you know, because clearly the machine is wrong. But it was so sad to watch this lady have a breakdown over a machine. And yeah, exciting things are happening at the Piggly Wiggly for most of us. Not all of us. The 
Well, from Birmingham, Alabama, this is the Midnight Citizen Show. Welcome in. I'm your host, Mike Booty, here again on a Saturday night. I'm just trying to figure that out. Like, what is that? That we seem to trust machines more than we do each other. I think if you talk to any logical person, they would say, of course I don't trust a machine over a person. But I don't know. We kind of do, don't we? We we trust these machines to know what we're, what our intentions are. You know, we trust like Alexa to know what our intentions are, you know, and we trust. Oh, Alexa actually didn't come on just now. I guess she does know I'm doing a podcast. See, that was a test. You passed. Good job, Alexa. It started to blink blue, (laughs) you know, but yeah, we, uh, we, uh, Oh, dang it, Alexa, you made me lose my train of thought because I was trying to fool you. (laughs) So, we trust these machines to know our intentions more than we do human beings. And I don't know quite what it is, um, what stock we put in machines. You know, obviously this quarantine has forced us all into our homes Most of us are still in them. I don't know. A lot of people are uh, coming out. Businesses are opening back up. But a lot of us, when we went into our houses three months ago, didn't miss a beat because the machines were there to uh, pick up the slack. We could still use our apps, you know, to uh, order groceries and order food and uh, sit inside and watch television all day. As soon as we were done with uh, binge watching our shows, you know, Netflix was right there with its algorithm ready to suggest something else that we may like. I love you, Netflix. You're my best friend. It's kind of like on Mr. Robot, you know, Alexa, do you love me? I don't know, that kind of thing. But I've witnessed um, in this era where the machines are rising, you know, this general uh, desire that we all have to be around machines more than we do around human beings. It's that feeling that like if you are on payday and you have to go deposit your check, of course I don't deposit my check at a bank anymore. I get direct deposit because I trust the machine to put my money where it needs to be. But if you still have that thing where you, you need to be physically at a bank to give the bank your money and put, put it in your account Uh, You might go through a drive-thru, all right? Um, Back in the day when I was still depositing my money in uh, physically in a bank, I would go and I would want to just go through the ATM. Very often when I would get there, I decided not to go to the ATM because the ATM was backed up like a drive-thru at Chick-fil-A. You're not familiar with Chick-fil-A. Chick-fil-A is the most popular fast food restaurant in the world now. It's surpassed McDonald's. They always have drive through lines that go out the block, you know? People are lining up at ATM. Meanwhile, I go into a teller drive through line where I can interact with a physical human being who's not even right in front of me. They're, they're uh, across the uh, way. And, and what is that? Why, why do people want to go to an ATM rather than a teller? I don't know. You know, another thing I've noticed is that a lot of us seem to be perfectly content paying for stuff that we don't need. Uh, these monthly subscriptions that renew. Because we all know that in order to cancel them, we would have to call up somebody and deal with a, a, a human being on a phone and push a whole bunch of numbers in order to get that human being, you know, and it's a lot of work to cancel something these days. 
This recently happened with uh, my satellite radio. I had a subscription to satellite radio, which I, you know, I would listen to every single morning on my way to uh, work. I'd listen to Howard Stern. And um, when the quarantine happened, I was no longer driving to work every day. I'm like, you know, I'm paying 26 bucks a month um, every month, you know, to not listen to my satellite radio. So I called up and canceled. And I decided I, 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 like any normal company that operates online, you might be able to go on to um, Sirius uh, XM satellite radio and just fill in a form and and hit cancel and they'll stop charging your credit card. You would think this would uh, be normal, but it, it, it wasn't so. And if you figured it out a way to cancel Sirius without having to pick up that phone and dial numbers, um, then please let me know about it. But I, I didn't, I didn't find out about it. I even Googled. They said that, no, you have to call them up. So call them up. I'm on the phone with them for 25, 30 minutes. Uh, they have to do all this stuff. And then of course they, um, will push a package on you. If anybody, by the way, is paying full price for your satellite radio, uh, you're a sucker. Okay. Because satellite radio, the second, and this goes for a lot of subscription services, you know, audible does the same thing. Um, if you try to cancel it, they will essentially give you a package for absolutely free. Uh, XM, got me down to eight bucks a month and now they're saying 30 bucks for uh for six months because i i ended up canceling my satellite radio that day i was like no i just don't i don't want to pay for something i don't need i appreciate it that's a good deal and now they call me once a week saying come back 60 bucks for the uh, for the for the year 30 bucks for six months we'll we'll come over and wash your car we'll give you a third generation echo dot as if like no, everybody in the world has those anyway. You know, but uh, this is a lot. A lot of people just keep paying for this stuff that they don't need, that they don't want, because I, I think like, they just do not want to deal with the aggravation of having to call up and cancel it. But yeah, in in almost every area of life, we're we're, remu- we're removing human beings from the situation because uh, we we are very comfortable with trusting machines these days. And I don't know if it's all because we, we feel like there's a human being behind it, even though we know that there's really not. These companies, uh, they, they just, they, they make a program and then they let the program take over. And, uh, and we're perfectly happy with that. But we, we say at the end of the day, we can always get a person. We can always get a person, you know. But yeah, tonight I was, uh, I was sitting around. I was uh, preparing my notes for the show and just uh, the television was on. And, you know, every other commercial was about the quarantine, uh, talking about uh, contactless delivery. You know, there was Carvana, there was Grubhub, uh, there there was uh, so much stuff talking about, uh, uh, you know, contactless delivery. You don't have to even talk to a person in order to get what you want. Curbside pickup, I mean, that, that I was not surprised by that at all. But Carvana, though, the, the, and CarMax, these companies that will actually give you a car, and you, you don't have to interact with a single person in order to do it. You just go and pick one up like like it's a vending machine or something. You just got it like a can of Coke and peanuts. That's amazing stuff. Because one of the most, one, the single thing that I think a lot of human beings dread in this world is having to go buy a car. And I've bought a car once. Um, and it's a long process. It takes about four or five hours. You can watch probably half of that Lord of the Rings trilogy and the time it takes you, you know, to buy a car. And there's these steps you have to go through where you offer, and then there's a counter offer, and then there's a counter counter offer. You have to go through the bank and, uh, you feel like your entire life is being put under a microscope before you can drive out in a Kia. So it's, it's a stressful situation. And here's this company that says, no, you just tap, 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 and there, you've got a car. You know? And we generally think a car salesman is pushy, slippery, dishonest, rubber band men, you know, as the song goes. Uh, but somehow we, we, we think that, like, an app is going to be honest with us and truthful. 
at least that's what the make uh, the commercials make it seem like. I don't know. You know. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, this quarantine, again, I know a lot of us are coming out of it now, um, even though I'm not sure the data suggests that that's such a good idea, but uh, I am I am picking up my life. I'm going more places, and I have to admit I'm part of that. I just want to get out and do things. But this quarantine was good for a lot of people who would rather deal with machines, who, who are natural introverts, who, who would rather just not deal with with pe- people on a daily basis, if a machine can do the job, then let's go ahead and let the machine do the job. You know, and it's uh, probably made us a lot of uh, a lot of us are very used to this now, and it's going to be tough to go back into the full swing of our lives and have to deal with people again in the office. As a teacher, I can tell you, you know, I just did three months of online classes, um, logging into Google Meets every day and seeing all my students. I could get fired for saying this, but the thing about it is, is that if a student started talking, I didn't, you know, and, and they wouldn't be quiet. It's not like in school where I have to tell them to be quiet, tell them to be quiet until I may have to send them out into the hallway here. I could just mute them, <laughs> mute them. It was awesome. I never had to do that though. My students are cool. They're good. They're good. They're good kids. <laughs> they never do anything wrong. Please don't fire me if my boss is listening. Yeah. You know. But yeah, I mean, that, that's going to be quite an adjustment to make, though. When I go back to school in August and I see these kids again, I can't do those uh, things that you can do on the uh, on the machine, you know. But yeah, my, machi- my, my, my theory, though, why we trust machines more than we do each other is that the machines, they help us, like, retain our identity, don't they? We're there with a the machine. If the machine breaks down, like, if, if, it, if it says that, you need to bag an item at the grocery store, the Piggly Wiggly, when you've already bagged it. It's the machine's fault. The machine is just a stupid box. Yet we're still arguing with it, but it's just a stupid box. It's the machine's fault. Whereas uh, if you're dealing with a person, then you have something to, some, somebody to blame, and there's a bit of a shame that comes with that blame, that you are blaming somebody. And that shame leads to empathy. And we feel bad that we treated that person that way afterwards, and some people I know don't, but the, deal, the, the thing with dealing with people is that it helps us grow as human beings. Right? We can see perspective. We can see... Uh, other people's uh, where they come from. We can see the emotions on their faces uh, of how our interaction with them is affecting them. Um, and, uh, you know, if that affects us for the bad, then, yeah, it's, if that affects us for the bad, I lost my train of thought there, sorry. <laughs> then we'll grow. And we might say, maybe we shouldn't have uh, blamed that person. Yeah. And then our identity might change a little bit. But no, when we deal with machines, we, we emerge from dealing with those, the same, uh, the same people that we did, that we were going into it. and I like dealing with machines when they get jobs done fast. Who uses machines, who uses phones these days more than machines, you know? They call us up all the time at all hours of the day and night. Wanting to uh, sell us stuff, so. Yeah. Yeah. Some big, uh, big anniversary to celebrate this uh, this week in the uh, history of the Midnight Citizen show. Yeah, I've been doing this show now uh, for ten years, and of course, I, I took three years off. I've talked about that on, um, on a recent episode that I did. 
where I just had to take uh, three years off so that I could fully con- concentrate on my job as a teacher and uh, not get uh, not have to do this show every week because it was uh, quite a lot of work. And uh, yeah, I think I'm coming back to do shows for the summer. I think I will be doing shows through the summer. I'm doing a live show right now. It's about a quarter to midnight here in Birmingham, Alabama, Central Standard Time. And um, if you're watching the live stream right now, welcome. But uh, you can also watch it later on. So if you need to duck out, if you need to miss some of it. And of course, if you're watching the show later on, you know that you can watch it later on because you're watching it now. (laughs) So... But yeah, back in 2012, I did a pretty uh, important project called the Downtown Drive-In. And I got a reminder from Facebook this week that that happened eight years ago this week. The Downtown Drive-In. It was uh, quite a remarkable achievement, if I do say so myself. It was just me and my wife uh, helping me out. And uh, what we did is I've always had this obsession with uh, drive-in movies. I see them as kind of the ultimate way to build a community around a movie, even though everybody's in their car. I mean, it seems to me like a very communal experience. And I grew up in a time where the drive-in was very heavily being phased out in the 80s and 90s. It it had already really been phased out by the time I was born. But uh, there are still drive-ins today. And and, in in 2011 and 2012, I went to a ton of them in uh, Alabama where I live just to get the feel of them. And they were pretty much everything that I thought that they were. These wonderful communities of people and cars running around, running back and forth to the snack bar, talking with each other, drinking on the bed, you know, sitting on the beds of their trucks, you know, drinking beers out of coolers and all that. It was nice. Beers out of coolers part may not be nice because they had to drive home afterwards, but, you know, I don't condone that. Still, it was nice. It was nice to see that. And I had this idea to start up my own drive-in. That, it, like, a, I guess the word pop-up wasn't in heavy use back there back then, but you would call it a pop-up drive-in. And my idea was to get a projector. And we would drive the car down to downtown to an urban area, and we would put the projector on top of the car and run the cord through the sunroof and plug the cord into um, a converter box and snap the converter box onto a battery and plug an FM transmitter for audio into the audio jack and turn it to a radio station. And then we would project that movie onto the side of a building and people could pull up and watch that movie, turn on their radios and listen to the sound beaming off the FM transmitter. And that sounds amazing. And I did this. I had this idea and I did it. I raised the money myself to go and do it, to get a projector and all the other equipment. All in, it was probably about 700 bucks. But it didn't stop there, though. Because I had to obviously go and make sure that I was legally in a parking lot. I didn't want the cops to show up and uh, I didn't have a permit to be there. So I had to do business with uh, a guy uh, who pretty much has a monopoly on public parking in the city of Birmingham. I don't know if you've ever dealt with these people, but they're not the Boy Scouts. Uh, they're, they're quite shady, shady people. And... Uh, You know, he ran a pretty high rate for his parking lot. I won't say what it is, but I was so desperate to do the project, so why not? And uh, he made me buy uh, insurance for it, too, which I understand, because if somebody gets hurt at the downtown drive-in, you know, liability has to cover it. So I I had to get insurance. And the weird thing is, though, shouldn't the guy have already had insurance? I'm just now thinking that. He should have already had insurance. I should have said that. See, I was very dumb eight years ago. <laughs> what was I, 30, 30 years old, 29? I don't know. Yeah, I could have I could have called him on that, actually. Why do I have to get my own insurance? You should have insurance. Um, 
And then he had to, uh, I had to pay for security as well. I did not deal with all this stuff, all these logistics again until my wedding. <laughs> you know, it's quite a, uh, it's quite a deal. So I later found out that the guy actually hired his own security force to just patrol his parking lots anyway to make sure the cars that were there weren't getting ripped off. So he was ripping me off. Uh, so it was, you know, it was very disheartening, but I put all of that stuff out of my head just to have this downtown drive and this dream of mine to build this community of people watching a movie together in a parking lot downtown, you know? And so we did a couple of shows that summer. Um, I ended up buying my own projector and and all the other, uh, knickknacks that go along with it. And, um, my wife and I, we pulled into a parking lot downtown that, that we had rented from the shady guy and the security guards even uh, showed up because they didn't have anything else to do. They showed up and watched the movie with us. First movie we showed was like a 1960s, uh, public domain movie called the sadist, which was based on, uh, uh, who's that guy the, the, um, Charles Starkweather, the lunatic juvenile delinquent who used to run around the badlands and kill hitchhikers or something like that. I don't know. Yeah. We showed that movie, the sadist, which was not really a family film, but, uh, but everybody really enjoyed it and it went so well and I didn't have to pay for the rights to that movie. And I thought this went so well and we ended up getting a little bit in the donation jar that the next movie I wanted everybody to show up for it. I wanted it to to be a big show. The first show we had about uh, 12 people show up. I was like, we can make this big. This could be the next big thing in Birmingham, you know? And so I put out a poll on a website that I had created for the downtown drive-in, which by the way is a great name. It's alliterative. And my wife, Jessica came up with it. I said, which of these four Hollywood movies would you like to see? And I can't remember what all of them were. I think maybe it was like the Blues Brothers. It was uh, National Lampoon's Vacation, Ghostbusters, and Jaws. And Back to the Future. And Back to the Future won out. I think we had something like 21 or 31 people vote for it. It was quite a big, uh, I was like, man, if all these people come, this, this could be a pretty good thing. So I had to go through this company in St. Louis that uh, rents uh, out movies and license them to show at like these special event screenings. Like the Alamo Draft House is kind of the big special event. I think that they had to go through them or something. Um, They'll rent them out to like parties and all that. And uh, it's a very, uh, these people are not any better than the parking lot attendant guy. (laughs) These people were pretty shady themselves. You know, because uh, sometimes you just show a movie and just treat it as just like having a bunch of people together. That that was the number one question I remember I got during this whole affair from people who came to the downtown drive-in. I mean, we're just a bunch of people getting together watching a movie. What's the big deal? Why do you need to pay money for it? And again, I, I just was, I wanted this to happen so much that I wanted to follow every legal channel. You know, hire security, get insurance. None of the stuff may even matter, but still, and I, and I'm paying hundreds of dollars for all of it, but I wanted it to happen so much. And I knew that eventually it could be sustainable and it could even turn a profit and get something started in Birmingham, Alabama, because there's just such a lack of uh, community around some of the, around this kind of stuff, around this grassroots stuff, you know, at least there was back then. I just, I really wanted this to happen. So I followed every legal channel ended up paying something like $250 for the rights to show the movie back to the future. And they even sent me a DVD of it. And I said, I I have a DVD of it. Yeah. So, so we showed this movie and I was really expecting at least 30 people to show up. And I think we got like four. Yeah. That's not the way things are supposed to go. When you have something like that, when you have a good turnout for one thing and then you do it again, you feel like it's really successful and then the numbers dwindle. And you're like, God, maybe this wasn't such a great idea after all. (laughs) 
So I had the blues pretty bad. I think you can listen to the Midnight Citizen shows I did from that summer of 2012 and, and hear it in my voice. I was pretty disheartened by it. And I, I had to I had to stop doing it. I could not keep throwing money at it. It just wasn't it. And um, everywhere I drove that summer and really up until the next two or three years, if I passed a giant brick building or a giant building with no signs on it and a light with in a parking lot with unobstructed light, I thought about resurrecting the downtown drive-in once again. This never happened. Later on in the summer of 2012, I got really desperate to do it again. And several people were asking me. And rather than being a jerk about it and saying, where were you the last time? I just uh, figured they all had excuses. That's fine. Okay. And uh, I went down here actually to the Piggly Wiggly parking lot because they have a nice white, you know, uh, uh, wall where you can project movies at night and they, it would be very unobstructive and it, it would show up really well. And I showed big trouble in little China. And this time I was taking a risk. <laughs> I don't think I told anybody at the time. This is a, this is a first. You're getting an honest response from the midnight citizen here. Uh, at the time I did not hire security. I did not talk to the piggly wiggly. I did it all gorilla. Everybody was enjoying the show. I think we had uh, like 10 people show up for that show. Some people even came in. I remember a car full of teenagers came in and they saw, man, is that big trouble in Little China? Old Jack Burton up there on that wall. I'm going to stop here. And they sat and watched it for a few minutes. And that was great. They just came in, got out. But I couldn't enjoy it at all because I was like sweating bullets. I was afraid I was going to get busted at any time. And I saw so many police cruisers driving up and down the street ready to bust me none of them did they didn't care they just did not care they've got too much stuff on their minds to worry about some kid showing big trouble in little china on the wall of the piggly wiggly Yeah. But it seems like drive-ins are coming back now. There was a lot of talk about drive-ins uh, a couple of months ago because drive-ins seem to be a safe way to get everybody together and watch a movie with uh, while still socially distancing. I think uh, in Miami, they actually uh, took that entire football stadium that got down there and turned it into a, a, a drive-in theater. And just cars could drive right right there onto the field and watch a movie. You know? And here in Birmingham, a Sidewalk Film Festival was going to have a pop-up drive-in, but then all these uh, race protests broke out, so they, they couldn't really do that anymore because a curfew was implemented. So, uh, yeah, that, that kind of took precedent over the pop-up drive-in. But... I think that's the thing in this time where it's like, we've got drive in everything, you know, we got a, we got drive in. I, I went to a drive in funeral. I went to a drive in graduation for my students. You know, you have, you even have drive in dine in service. You know, you drive up <laughs> to a restaurant, they give you your food and you can go and sit in the parking lot and eat it. Why not drive in movies? Why not bring them back? I think just the uh, people love drive in movies. Every time I've been to a drive in movie, there's this general feeling of freedom and community in it. Now, I'll tell you something else. I talked about the movie theater net last week and whether or not it, it deserves to go away. The thing about the movie theater is you stand up at the end of, fi- of the film and, you know, your floors, your, your shoe is essentially sticks to the floor. There's none of that at the drive-in theater. You're in your own car. If your shoes stick to the floor of your car, that's your own problem, you know? <laughs> yeah drive-in should absolutely come back and that's uh that's how i feel about it that's right it's natural all 
right, we're just getting started here. I'm going to play some music for you, and I'll see you back after that break.
course, I was just thinking that uh, maybe the drive-in won't be coming back. So yeah, even though the data is uh, still indicates that we're far away from this coronavirus, we still seem to be ignoring it in great droves. I was sitting outside last night outside of my uh, house having a cigar and uh, live up the street from this uh, big uh, restaurant and bar district that's been silent since early March. All these places were closed and now they're opening back up. So you got all these uh, preppy guys, these preppy college age guys and their princess girlfriends, you know, walking down there. Valerie, catch up. Oh my God. Okay, fine. You try walking in these boat shoes, you know, stuff like that. It's uh, something that's uh, seemed like happened so long ago and now it's coming back and just things seem to be like they're returning to normal. Although I just don't think that we're done, done with this whole thing. I'm, I'm still wearing my mask places and So we're getting back to uh, the world, and everything's returning to normal. Have we learned anything from it? I don't know. Maybe we don't. Yeah, drive-ins may very well not be coming back after all. That's what I wanted to say. Yeah, welcome in. A little past midnight now. Yeah, I wanted to uh, say that this show, if you're listening online, it can be downloaded by going to onsug, O-N-S-U-G dot com, the Overnight Scape Network of Podcasters. I've been on ever since 2011. You can download the show there. Uh, I will say, though, that this week I have been working on a new website that is live right now. It's I'm still working on it, but it is ready for viewing. For the Midnight Citizen, it's at mikebooty.com slash the Midnight Citizen. And uh, I know that that's different from the website I had in the old days, which was just the midnightcitizen.com. But now, uh, as a working professional, uh, I, I do find the need these days that I do need to have my own professional website and I consider uh, what I do here at the Midnight Citizen to be part of that uh, kind of professional nature. Without getting too, uh, you know, day people on you, I do uh, a lot of things on uh, for the show that seem to be an extension of, of my professional life, uh, an extension of my research that I do as an educator to work with students to learn so that I can interpret. Uh, I do a lot of writing for the show. And uh, I see it as an extension of my professional personality. So uh, I, I did create a website, mikebooty.com, when then the, you can type in the URL slug, The Midnight Citizen, and uh, go there. And if you want to hire me as a freelance writer uh, or editor, anything like that, please give me, give me a shout out on that website. You can go there and check it out. Yeah, it took me about a week to build the website. It was pretty easy. I did it on Squarespace. And I'm probably the only podcaster or YouTuber out there who doesn't get paid for saying that. Yeah. So I'm here in the studio and just poured myself some whiskey. I've got here some Evan Williams whiskey. Kentucky straight bourbon. And this is bottom shelf whiskey. Uh, I do not have a whole lot of money these days to uh, spend on alcohol. Uh, but but I got to tell you, you could do a lot worse than uh, Evan Williams whiskey. I always feel a little bit of a shame when I go into the uh, ABC store to ask for it. I feel like... I feel like I'm buying pornography or something, but it's, uh, it, it is good whiskey and, uh, don't knock it until you tried it. Yeah. I always felt weird buying it because it's so cheap and whiskey is supposed to something that you're supposed to spend good money on. You know, uh, the, the, 
I've met some some whiskey drinkers who will say I won't stoop any further than bullet bourbon, which bullet bourbon I consider to be a delicacy. You know, that stuff is like eighteen dollars for like a small little bottle and you gotta spend, you know, fifty bucks for a fifth of it. <laughs> I don't have that kind of money. You know, and you buy a bottle of whiskey, you take it over uh, to, to some friend's house. I mean, you're gone. It's done by the end of the night. You just spent 50 bucks for a whiskey uh, of which you only got to drink about a, you know, a fifth of that bottle, you know, <laughs> so. So Evan Williams, it, it, it does the job. It, it, it definitely does the job. And I went into the ABC store, I think back in, I was going to say like back in February, to um to buy some Evan Williams whiskey and I walked in there one night that night and there was a lady there who was doing uh, a like a, a, a taste testing or a sampling she was standing behind a, a table and she was sampling bourbon from some, some of the finest distilleries in Kentucky she said and I passed her by. I would have liked to have a, a, some free bourbon, but there was a line of people at the table. And so I walked on by. I just wanted to get in and get out. I, I really don't like to loiter in, in liquor stores. They're not the most pleasant of places to be. just wanted to get my liquor and get out. So I, I reached for the bottom shelf. And while I'm looking for my uh, Evan Williams and doing that thing that I always do when I go into a liquor store, decide if it's like a, a top dollar night, do I, you know, do I want to, just go with Evan Williams or do I want to spend a little bit more money, have a little less fun this weekend and just get the nicer bourbon for tonight. So I decided to just go with the Evan Williams cause I, you know, I'd like to have some money left over <laughs> for Saturday and Sunday. And I, uh, I get it. And while, while I'm doing that, I, there are a couple of guys there who, you know, in business attire and, uh, they look like they've just come from like a stockholders meeting. Listen, I'm not judging. I'm not classist. Okay. At all. But when you look at these guys, young urban professionals, okay. Standing there with this cute girl who's giving them free shots of bourbon and they're testing it and they're like, oh, it's very smooth, very balanced. You know, they're, they're really putting on that they know what they're talking about. Okay. It's like, look how level it is in the glass. It's very, it's like it's a uh, toxicity is, is quite unique. <laughs> okay. This isn't what they said. I'm just, I'm stereotyping them here, but you know, you get what I mean. You know, so I said, okay, that to each his own man. But you know, this girl was just back behind the counter. She was like, I know, I know. Right. I, I, right. Right. You know, just going on with whatever they sell. They said so that they, she could sell them some bourbon. Okay. And so I take my Evan Williams uh, to the counter and, and, and who do I end up in front of the, these two guys, these, these stockbroker guys behind me, they're probably not stockbrokers. I don't think there's a stock exchange in Birmingham, Alabama. They probably work for like BBVA or Regions Bank or something. It's a big banking center. They probably work for a bank. Okay. And it's February, so they're all bundled up in their nice, uh, I don't know, urban, young, professional, chic suits and ties with giant, you know, pea coats and all that and leather gloves. And they're standing in line with their top shelf whiskey that they uh, I overheard that they were buying for a buddy of theirs. Cause it was his bachelor party this weekend. They, they only wanted the best for him is what they said to the girl, <laughs> you know, and it was obviously a come online because uh, nobody, when they're talking about their friends really wants the best for their friends. They want the best for themselves. Uh, or maybe that's just me. I don't know <laughs> in my circle of friends. So, so I'm there with my Evan Williams. I'm about to check out. And uh, all of a sudden I hear this kid. That, well, I say this kid, this guy behind me. I say that because, listen, I'm not a very tall guy. I'm about 6'8", 6'8", 5'8", 5'9", somewhere around there. But next to this guy, I was Andre the Giant. I was gigantic, okay? This is a little, this is a little guy, little fella, you know, here next to me. And he says, wow, Evan Williams, you must be partying tonight. And I looked at it and I was just like, oh, yeah, 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 big party guy. And he's like, can I ask you a question? What do you mix that with? 
And I looked at it and I was like, mix it. Uh, nothing. I'm just going to like drink it straight. And the guy's like, straight? What's wrong with you? How, how do you drink that stuff? Um, I just, I, I open it up and I, tw- it's a little twist off cap and I pour it in a glass and I, I drink it alone with nobody else. That's how I drink it, but I didn't say any of that. I was just astonished that this guy could just be standing there in a liquor store and just judging my liquor. That was like, uh, that's something that you see on like a television show where they want to build sympathy for the poor protagonist. Um, I wonder if this guy knew that he was playing like a villain in that moment. Does anybody ever know when they're playing a villain? I don't think I've ever played a villain in my life, but I don't know. I, I, I wouldn't know. Most villains think that they're doing good things. This guy probably thought he was just joking around with me, I guess. Or maybe he genuinely was interested in my uh, my mixology. But when I said that I drank this stuff straight, this Evan Williams Kentucky bourbon, 1695 for a fifth of it, thought I was drinking, uh, thought I was drinking swill or something. I was so astonished by it. I went home and I think I probably ranted to my wife for like an hour about it because I was so so taken aback by it. See, that's the thing when you when you're a podcaster and and you you're used to uh, letting all of it out of you at, at the end of the week in a studio into a microphone, and then that's taken away from you. The very close people in your life have to take, have to pay the price by listening to all your rants and ravings. Yeah, this guy, he was a little, he was a little guy, he was a little fella. You were having sex with a little fella. I always love that line in Fargo. <laughs> yeah. So, everyone's doing well tonight. Yeah. But I think the reason why people are retreating into their homes so much over the last three months is obviously because of this coronavirus, but now people are coming out. I think the reason is uh, because it's not so much in the news anymore. Uh, You know, this uh, George Floyd, this uh, gentleman who was uh, killed by a police officer in Minneapolis, um, Minnesota, for, I guess, allegedly resisting arrest or there's there's video of him refusing to get out of the car and and then he gives in and and the the guy is on his uh, the police officer is on his throat for nine minutes and while these people are standing by telling the guy that to stop and george floyd is calling for his mother it's just a really tragic thing just really awful and you cannot look at the video and just think okay um george floyd deserved that all right but nevertheless uh it's it, it spawned all these protests uh, with protests turned into riots. And it just seems to me like, uh, it seems to everybody, you know, like, um, enough of this already, when are we going to have change? And nobody really seems to know what that change is going to be and what it means. I talked about a lot of this stuff last week because last week in Birmingham, Alabama, which is obviously not had the best uh, history with uh, black people in the history of the world. Um, you know, we had, uh, we had, Peaceful protests. They started out as peaceful and then they turned into riotous. When uh, they went over to Lynn Park and started tearing down uh, this Confederate monument that had been there since uh, something like the 1917 to honor the, I think it was the Confederate Navy. They started tearing this thing down and uh, it seemed to be like more of an act of emotional, you know, rebellion and rather than it was practical civil destruction uh, because they attached like a rope to this five story concrete monument to try and pull it down with like a, 
a four by like a truck with no four wheel drive. It, was, it, was, it didn't really work very well. And uh, the mayor, the black mayor of Birmingham, Randall Woodfin, came down and he got he got in front of them and he said, "Give me, I know you guys want this down. Give me." 24 hours to work with the state and I'll get it down. And so the protesters seemed to be okay with that. And, uh, and then somebody started throwing bricks and buildings and, and going crazy. And they started uh, spray painting all of the monuments in Lynn park, not just the Confederate ones. Uh, they spray painted the monument for the uh, Spanish Spanish civil war. They spray painted the monument for world war one. And they started damaging that one so bad that it had to be taken down so that the city could restore it. And, um, and it was quite a night, and it was pretty much only one night of these riots, but it got very bad, and they stormed all over downtown and started throwing uh, you know, rocks and, and buildings and, and bricks, anything they could find. And um, then all these businesses in Birmingham started uh, just fearing for their, for, for, their, for their merchandise and started going around and boarding everything up. So my wife and I this week, you know, we, we took a trip downtown and we just we just saw it and it was so eerie we went down there 11 30 on a monday morning which it should be bustling downtown at 11 30 on a monday morning but no i mean it, it looked like escape from new york at lunchtime the streets were deserted there were there were newspapers just blowing through the park uh, lynn park itself was fenced up and, uh, yeah, there was just spray paint everywhere. And the only people you saw walking around were homeless. And, uh, we got hit up several times for change that these homeless people walking around like zombies, just looking for somebody that they can uh, panhandle to or somebody to take care of them. I don't know. It's incredibly, uh, just a tragic scene down there, you know? And then we, uh, went to the outer neighborhoods. We walked around, uh, some of those this week, um, just to, Again, see how other the other neighborhoods are treating this because there was a lot of fear that uh, the protests could actually spread to other parts of the city and places like Walmart and Target were starting to board up. Places up at the summit, there were just all these murmurings that uh, riots could break out in any economic center of the city. And then a couple of business owners were not very smart and I guess sent emails to their staff saying perhaps kind of some racist things or some inciting language, which I get that we live in a country of free speech, but this is not really the time that you want to pay, be passing judgment on dead African-Americans at the hands of uh, police officers. And this one gentleman who owns a bar called Parkside, which already gets a lot of flack on a daily basis for being one of the places that came into a historically black area and gentrified it. Um, fired a couple of his employees for attending the, the protest and uh, then said that there should be a protest tax. And to put a cherry on top of that, he called George Floyd the dead man who yelled for his mother as his breath was failing him and slipping away into death under the knee of a police officer, a thug. And he decided not to board up his business. And, uh, what do you know? The next day, somebody threw a rock in his business. There it is. There. Another place, uh, this place called Little Savannah. Apparently, the uh, owner also said some things that maybe were not that sensitive and, and tone deaf. And We went by there. He had boarded up his place. He probably realized maybe I shouldn't have said that stuff, so he boarded up his place good. But yeah, I mean, just the city right now, it looks like a construction site. It's absolutely crazy. I went into a Starbucks today. There was nobody in there except a couple of employees. Never seen that before. Amazing. Even when I worked there, there's always somebody in Starbucks. <laughs> um, I think I'm saying that for Paul because I think he's watching right now. Paul is my old manager at Starbucks who's actually watching the live stream right now. Hello, Paul. I'd love to look at your comments if you're making any, but uh, <laughs> I need to focus. <laughs> Very easy these days for me to lose my uh, train of thought doing this podcast.
But yeah, so uh, the next day after uh, those protests, Mayor Randall Woodfin made good on his promise and he actually tore this Confederate monument down. And, you know, there's this thinking these days, there's such debate over what these Confederate monuments actually mean and, 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 and what taking them down would actually mean. And yeah, I am of the mind that we should not erase history and, 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 you know, we should use these things to teach ourselves and, and, and learn from the mistakes of the past. Okay. I think in Germany, they, 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 they go like deep into world war two and who caused it. Okay. And, uh, the country that, uh, everybody sort of in the world was coming after. All right. And they seem to have a top flight educational system, but in, in America, we seem to just like really want to push everything under the rug. And we're always trying to hit the reset button on the NES, you know, just, just start that game over again, you know? But I am of the, I am of the mind though, you know, that if a monument is in a city that does not want it, a city that may have once wanted it, but not anymore. Okay. That city has the right to say, no, we don't want it anymore. Let's take it down. Let's take it down. Okay. And so that's, that's what the city wanted to do a couple of years ago when people started, uh, you know, pouring over this Confederate monument. This is right after the uh, person died at that protest in uh, Charlottesville, Virginia. And, uh, we here in Birmingham just said, we don't, we don't want it up there anymore. Okay. And we told the state that we didn't want it up there anymore. Now, Alabama is a very red state. It's a very Republican state, but Birmingham is a very blue city. And so when Birmingham told the state, we're taking the Confederate monument down, we don't want it up there anymore. Uh, the state said that we are going to fine you if you take it down. Initially, they said, we're going to fine you $25,000 a day for every day that it's down. That's a lot of money. Okay, so say you have it down for the whole week. Yikes. Quite a bit. $250,000, okay? That's uh, that's that's a lot for a small city like Birmingham. All right? And then the city came back and said, "Okay, we won't take it down, but we will board it up. We're going to take a bunch of plywood flats, go down to the Home Depot, get them and uh and just put, you know, five stories of of plywood over the thing." And the state said, "No. $25,000 a day." So then the city of Alabama, all right, stood up to the state and they said, okay, fine. We're just going to cover it up. You can fine us, fine us. We won't pay it. <laughs> so they did that. It was a pretty, pretty gutsy move. Okay. And then when the attorney general of the state of Alabama said, okay, fine, $25,000 a day, <laughs> the governor stepped in and said, okay, that's a little bit too much. <laughs> find them $25,000, just flat out $25,000. Okay. They said, okay, fine. $25,000. So the city paid it. All right. Now it's still there two years later. And this is a couple weeks ago. It still has, it still covered up and people start tearing it down. The state says, okay, you tear it down. It's another $25,000. And then people were like, Protesters just go crazy. They said, we've exhausted all legal channels. We're going to tear this down, thing down ourselves. We're not going to wait for the courts. And they tear it down. They, they start taking it down. And then the mayor is saying, okay, give me a day. All right. And then people still go crazy. But anyway, $25,000, though, does not seem like in the grand scheme of things. And the one thing that I was disappointed in my city that I wish they had done is start a GoFundMe page. If the people of Birmingham really want that thing down so bad, put a GoFundMe page up there, make your goal $25,000 and you can get it done in one day. And it would also be the people of Birmingham showing that we have moved on as a city, that we are no longer the city of fire hoses and police dogs. $25,000 fine. And then it's gone. That's great. I've seen nerdy filmmakers raise $25,000 on Kickstarter in two days for their documentaries about Calvin and Hobbes. But, um, you know, 
There does seem to be a little bit of good news, though, in that um, a lot of other cities are starting to say, we don't want these monuments here, let's take them down. But, again, I'm just not sure if it's so good about erasing history, because when you start doing that and, and going after the really obvious targets, like monuments that honor Confederate soldiers who fought for this oppressive system of slavery, then you start going after the tangential ones. You start going after the Thomas Jefferson memorials. Well, maybe Thomas Jefferson wasn't so much of a tangential target. I mean, he kept slaves and, and, and had, had affairs with them and refused to set them free until he died, you know, but, um, but yeah, you can start like looking at any piece of statuary, you know, in the country and tying it back to some messed up system that we no longer believe in as Americans. And then what are we going to have? And I'm sure not the first person to say this. We're going to have a lot of angry, desperate pigeons on our, our, on our hands and our heads. Yeah, just over the, you know, past two weeks, I've talked about this to death. I think if you were to put every conversation together that I've had with, with all the, with anybody over the past two weeks, it it would easily probably be about 18 hours worth of audio. Just a lot of, a lot of talking, trying to figure this out going on. I have my perspective, but I'm trying to find out other people's as well, which is what we should all do. Talk to people who have different perspectives. Obviously I'm a white person and I talked last week on the show that it's very sometimes a little bit difficult to be a white guy in America. No, I didn't say that. But if you are a white person, you you uh, you are universally acknowledged as having it very easy in this world, okay? And 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 to say anything as a white person that diverges by a small little hairline from uh, the popular opinion that doesn't line up with uh, a three-word hashtag can be grounds for crucifixion in this culture. So you have to be a little careful about how you say things. Uh, so I, I've been going around having some pretty tough conversations with people, with all my friends in the past week, staying on social media and just doing it in person. Okay. Cause uh, social media is a machine and you cannot reason with a machine, even if there are real people behind it. And I genuinely believe that. So you, you got to talk to these people face to face not over text messaging even. So I try to do this. I've had a lot of conversations with, with, you know, with, with my white friends about the fact that, you know, this is a cancel culture. You know, we, we're tearing down these monuments, but, but we're not really going after the thing that's causing the problems. We're, we're going after symbols, and symbols are not, do not cause problems. Okay, they stand for those problems, but they ultimately don't cause them. And uh, we're taking out all of our hate and our frustration and our catharsis on things that ultimately aren't aren't going to get anything done. So we were talking about cancel culture and, 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 you know, uh, erasing these monuments. And uh, just every single day, there's a new story, uh, HBO Max removing Gone with the Wind uh, uh, off of their streaming service because it depicts slavery, even though it's a very important piece of film history. I never cared for it that much, but it is the first movie that gave uh, an Academy Award to an African-American actress, uh, you know, um, removing Dukes of Hazard from any streaming service because of the uh, Confederate flag on the General Lee and the way that the horn honks Dixie. You know? And um, rebranding Splash Mountain. Uh, because it's based on the on the Uncle Remus tales, you know, from Song of the South. Uh, you know, we can talk about all these, but is it really solving the problem at the end of the day? That's that's what I was really talking about mostly with most of my with my, my white friends. Is this really 
what's causing the problem, you know? And um, I went this week also, and, and, and I, I set out on the patio at, 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 the friend of, at the house of another friend, you know, who is African-American. We sat out there for probably five hours and just drank about, went through about two and a half bottles of wine. At the end of it, our, our, our conversation wasn't making a whole lot of sense, but for a while it did. <laughs> okay. And uh, just to hear his perspective as, as, as a black man who has been pulled over before unfairly by the police when he's just been out driving home pulling him over, asking him to get out of the car. You know, these, these things he says are, are very common things. They are not invented by the media. These are very common things that happen to him and his black friends constantly. And, um, just trying to hear him out. And like, I've never been in that position where I've been pulled over for no reason by a police officer before I've been questioned for no reason by a police officer before. And it's a terrible feeling. Uh, this one time, I think I've told the story on the podcast before these three cops confronted me at this, uh, at this concert here in Birmingham about 15 years ago. And I was a little fellow back then. <laughs> and I had a beer in my hand that they, they started alleging that I had snuck into the park, which I had, and I had bought it, you know, I bought the $6 Miller High Life. Why would I sneak a $6? <laughs> why would I sneak a Miller High Life into a park? I, if I'm going to sneak beer into a park, it's going to be a, a lot nicer than Miller High Life, you know? And they just confronted me and got me into a corner and uh, forced me to throw the beer in the trash can. They got in my head to the point where I couldn't argue them, with them anymore because I didn't want to go to jail. And they have all the power there. And that was a, a frightening experience. And uh, I can only imagine, you know, what it must be like as a, as a black person who's kind of perceived as this, uh, you know, as this, the, the, the number one customer of uh, police officers, you know, and just trying to get his perspective on it was something that was important to me this week. And I've been trying to talk to everybody about what these catchphrases mean. Black Lives Matter and defund police. Because for a while they were popping up and they just seemed to come out of nowhere, like a hashtag. Hashtags, just somebody invents them and then somebody retweets them and then they become these trending hashtags. But somehow, like, Black Lives Matter has become this movement. And I am a little confused about who is actually running this movement. If I want to send money to this to this fund, I, I send it to it, but... Who does it go to? What does it get spent on? And I'm just trying to figure this stuff out. I'm not just going to go out there and just say Black Lives Matter without knowing what that really means. Of course, Black Lives Matter. And I know what they're saying in society is that not everybody think that, thinks that Black Lives Matter. And they do get fed up with politicians who spit back out the phrase, all lives matter, okay? And these politicians who say, you know, blacks are actually not a minority anymore. There's more blacks than there are whites. Okay, I think the black people are saying, okay, fine, who controls the wealth? You can't say that you're a minority if you don't have control over the purse, I think is what they're trying to say. And then this defund the police thing, I was trying to figure out that what, what that meant too. And because um, it sounds on the surface like you want to take money away from police officers and just have, uh, I don't know, like a citizen controlled police force or I don't know. And see, movements don't do this so much anymore if they're born out of hashtags. Movements send out press releases. They organize things, but none of this stuff seems to be organized. It all just seems to be popping up spontaneously. And so that's all I was trying to figure out is who is really behind all this. And I'm not conspiratorial at all. I just genuinely am kind of confused about who's leading these movements. And I was talking to everybody about this. Everybody else seems to be just as confused as I do. What everybody knows for sure though, is that there's something wrong and we need to be doing something about it. 
So what I come to understand, though, is that this defund police thing is not necessarily about taking all the money away from the police. It's just about defunding the police. The way that we throw billions of dollars, uh, a disproportional amount of money every year into the military, we throw so much money into the police and we expect them to solve all of society's problems. So they can't do that. So take some of that money and throw it to these social programs to help underserved communities build themselves up and give them some kind of a wealth that they can pass down to their children. Okay. I think that that's what it means. And I think that that's a great idea and it it definitely doesn't get the police always meet the people at the end of the line, take that money and throw it a little bit further on rather than them arresting a kid who's all he's known all of his life is violence on the street. Take that money and throw it down to the beginning of that kid's life and give him a nice daycare center. And then when he's in elementary middle school, give him a place to go, a community center where he can go and, 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 and do things and not be out on the street. Okay. That's what, that, that's what I think everybody understands defund police to mean, but a lot of people just hear that term and it's a hashtag and they're just done with it. Okay. We're not going to take all the money away from the police. They, they don't go any further than that. And that's such a problem with whatever you want to call it. Hashtag culture, not having organized movements with press releases and, 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 and organized spokespeople, people at the top, a hierarchy, you know, and that's, that's what I think is a, it's a major problem right now. At least as I've observed it, I don't know. But I think like a major concern also is that again, we're not seeming to sit down and talk to each other face to face. And and all of our interaction seems to be taking place uh, via machines these days. Okay. What do you know? I've got a theme this week about that. But there's also the problem of us, like we, we identify ourselves through online identities that aren't necessarily true, that are little bits and snippets of who we actually are. And we also project ourselves onto monuments and onto trademarks and slogans like Gone with the Wind and Dukes of Hazard and, and Splash Mountain. And these are things that we want to tear down because that's how we identify ourselves these days is through the media that we consume, the pop culture idolatry in, in, in the video. And I think we're, we're so saturated with this that we're moving further and further away from who we really are. And um, when you have a watershed moment, like a couple of weeks ago when all these protests and riots broke out, that was a moment where people like woke up and realized who they are. And then they went right back to bashing in the slogans and the trademarks and the monuments and the things that they just don't, they identify themselves as. We just, we just got to get off of all this. All this pop culture worship. Staying inside all day and watching videos. And with that, let's go down to the Video Street Video Store to watch some videos. I'll be back in a few minutes. Watch these, and and I'll be back. Now, you had to do your own research, come to your own conclusions. Now, with the work almost completed, you're facing some difficult choices. It's not as easy as a simple yes or no, is it? Part of me wishes I'd never even started. Choices. It's not only rock music now, but my friendship with Marty's shaky because of all this. And Melissa's not exactly happy. She expects me to go back the way it was before all this started. And Mom's been real nice so far, but what if I do decide to go back to my old music? If 
I make my decision one way, my friends are going to hate me. And if I make my decision the other way, my parents are going to kill me. Well, I think you may be exaggerating the point just a little bit. Besides, aren't you forgetting someone? Who? Jesus Christ. If you do what Christ wants, all the other things are going to fall into place. He's not testing you beyond what you're able to handle. Stick with it these next few days. And remember, it's your decision. Yeah. It's my decision. <sighs> okay. Up All Night is brought to you by 20th Century Fox's Robin Hood, Men in Tights. A Mel Brooks film starts Wednesday at theaters everywhere. And now back to the film that shows just what could happen when you take really good stock footage and mess it up by putting a movie in there. Vampire on Bikini Beach on USA Up All Night. Well, I guess that's long enough. I really have been robbed. This would have been a good show, too. Damn. We now return to Vampire and Bikini Beach on USA, up all night. the movie that should make your TV set very happy that there are no gun shops open at this hour. Vampire on Bikini Beach on USA up all night. You know, it's a funny thing about getting robbed. I don't exactly know what it is, but I'm sure there's something funny about it. Hi, I'm Gilbert Gottfried, USA up all night, and I've been robbed. the kind of acting, directing, and overall quality of filmmaking that makes you want to stand up and walk over to the director and say, first film, right? I thought so. Vampire on Bikini Beach on USA, up all night. You know what I hate about being robbed? Makes you have to buy new stuff. outside of looking at somebody's wedding video. Yes, it's the return of Bob's band. Vampire on Bikini Beach, USA, up all night. Bob's band, wedding video. Bob's band, wedding video. Bob's band, wedding video. Bob's band, wedding video. with more of USA Up All Night, right after this. Hi, I'm Gilbert Gottfried, USA Up All Night, and we're watching Vampire on Bikini Beach. And coming up, Mariusz Obrichowski, who plays Falco, the vampire in the movie, does what he does best, goes on screen and ruins the family name. Vampire on Bikini Beach, on USA, up all night. And now the conclusion of Vampire on Bikini Beach, on USA, up all night. How can I tell if I'm really in love? How can I tell if I am really in love? How can I, How tell, can I tell if, if I'm, I'm really in love? love? How can I tell if I'm really in love? If we knew the answer to that, we'd be at the end of the video instead of the beginning. 
This is my brother Jason. By the way, I'm Justine. We'd like to get you together with about a hundred other guys who feel just the way you do. We might get an insult contest where I'd say something about her, you know, and then she'd say something about me, seeing who could uh, get the worst possible uh, insult. Love. <laughs> it comes over in a very physical way, like all over your body. It's like this elation, like you feel really, really good, like you can do anything. The one word for real love is ecstasy. On the good side of love is fun sex. The ultimate fulfillment, and when you're totally fulfilled, it's as if you're on the planet Z of funness. Galactic. <laughs> planet Z, yeah. Hey, you guys, I'm Ted. I'm here to... Oh, my God, it's so awesome. Okay, if you say so. I hear you. The one thing the guy wants is sex, and rightfully so. Come on. <laughs> Did you girls know that a guy cannot go for more than two days without having sex? <laughs> no, it's true. Terrific. See you in 48 well, hours. that took care of that. God gave you a beautiful body. Share it. Uh, why, why don't we just toss this over here? Listen, we're, we're all sexual. Honest. I'll pull out in time. <laughs> now, guys, you know that's a lie. Are you girls taking notes on this? A lot of girls are looking for scams, too. Excuse me, could I have your number? Got a phone? Excuse me. Nice car. I like your ass. Well, you can't have a conversation with an ass. You would if you loved me. 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 Oh. You would, 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 would. If you loved me. Oh. Hey, why don't we get comfortable? Well, I know about love, like, love my parents, love my dog, but love my boyfriend, I don't know about that. Love hurts, and it can, and it probably will. Some people have the ability to just turn off their heart. I decided I was going to go home and hate him. First he didn't like my hair. Then he didn't like my clothes. I'm in love, I'm in love, and I want you to know that. I hate those people. It's gotta be something good about me. Oh, he was so T and gay, he was so T S. And he wondered if she was G I B. He set up H T T. And my fantasy is to be I T B of my L T D. And she said, Yes! <laughs> Right back here on the planet Z of funness. It's the Midnight Citizen Show. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed uh, those videos from the Video Street Video Store, that euphoric place we go every week. Well, you go. I use the bathroom. To check out the Video Weird. This week we had a collection of three fun videos to keep you up all night. We had a clip from rock. It's your decision. One of the greatest Christian anti Satan films of all time from 1982, a film that was actually produced in Huntsville, Alabama, only a stone's throw about an hour and a half away from me. After that, we had a clip from USA Up All Night, Vampire on Bikini Beach, although you knew that because Gilbert Gottfried said it like about eight or nine times in that clip. USA Up All Night is one of the great alternatives to Monster Vision in the 80s and 90s. Rhonda Up All Night, I think she was on Friday. Gilbert Gottfried was on Saturday. Great time to slip down into the den and watch television while your parents are, are in bed. And then we had, uh, how can I tell if I'm really in love? One of the best awkward direct to video public service announcement films of all time. I'm pretty sure that was Ted Danson in that video doing community service. And they had a uh, Justine Bateman who was on uh, family ties at the time. And her brother, Justin Bateman, who was on the less popular, the Hogan family at the time. 
getting really close to each other as, as brother and sister. That's kind of like, ugh, but you know, talking about sex. Hope you like those videos. Once again, I am live here tonight in the studio. And if you are listening in the future, you can catch this live stream, even though you're not here with me in this time and place, in this universe, by checking out the link in the show notes of the description of this episode, going to mikebooty.com slash the Midnight Citizen. And you can watch this entire live stream, including the pre-show where I mix and generally get really frustrated at all of my technology and also the post show last week. I did about a 10 minute post show where I talked with a few people who had been watching the show, which was awesome. And, um, and also, uh, you know, just talk about some random things, anything that anybody wants to talk about. And, uh, also just enjoying it while I, uh, I just am in here and I celebrate the fact that I've just done a show and, it's a great feeling to be in here and just finish a show for another week. And it's one o'clock in the morning. You're just sitting in here in the studio and enjoying the feeling of getting something done. And with all that being said, let's take a trip to Viscaga, Alabama along the banks of the Cobber River. It's been a radical week down there. In the second week of June, life has settled into leisure for the people of Viscaga. Though the citizens still work and pay their bills, there is an undeniable sense of peace in the evening. You can feel this peace if you cruise along the streets and through the neighborhoods. It's actually very common to do this, cruise. Just cruise. Like driving around and looking at lights at Christmas time. You get in your car... And you drive without purpose, just to smell the barbecue pits and hamburgers grilling, the centronella candles burning and the chlorine cleansing in the above-ground pools. Just to hear the stereos, the beat blasters with speakers the size of cinder blocks, perched in the bedroom windows, tuned to the top 40 stations broadcasting live from their studios atop Red Mountain, serenading the outdoor world. Just to hear the bats dinging and the crowds cheering at Purcell Park. In the second week of June, you can drive around and sense that life is as it should be in the summertime and that no one is forcing it that way. In the afternoon, there is an undeniable silence in this piece. It's mostly due to the baking heat and the sun hanging directly overhead. And the only place in Viscaga to find a loud piece is at the community pool or down at the muddy banks of the Cahaba River where there is diving and splashing and top 40 blasting from car stereos. Many residents begin escaping this heat, or really the wet, hot humidity this time of the month, packing their trunks full and throwing excess baggage on the tops of their cars and kissing the town goodbye as they enter the interstate and from there heading onto the beach or Disney World or the Grand Canyon or up the Blue Ridge Parkway into the cool shade of the Appalachian Mountains. For some, this is a security concern. Because while Viscaga is a peaceful town, it is by no means crime-free, and the blocks of empty houses sometimes tend to attract a criminal element this time of year. At least they did two summers ago when there was a blitzkrieg of looted subdivisions, a total of 11 houses ripped off in broad daylight while their owners happily picnicked in the mountains and swam in the ocean and snapped pictures with the likes of Goofy and Mickey Mouse hundreds of miles away. The fact that the victims had all been vacationing at the time suggested to Sheriff Arquette that this had been a coordinated attack, and the next year he won re-election on a platform that was built on beefing up residential security in the summertime. One of Sheriff Arquette's ideas that had gone over famously with voters after that crime spree summer was to allow a volunteer force of citizens to lend a lookout, to observe and report any suspicious activity, and extend the reach of his tiny police force. Now, at all hours of the day, it is a common sight during your leisurely cruise through Viscaga to see roving cars mounted with consumer-bought sirens and CB antennas and magnets on their doors announcing Citizen Patrol, 
and men in monogrammed white shirts, khakis, and walkie-talkie holsters going door to door. And this is what brought Jim Keating to the door Wednesday at midday, a doorbell that wouldn't quit, and loud knocks in intervals. He stumbled up the stairs from his basement apartment in a hungover stupor, still a little drunk from the night before. He would have been happy to keep lying in bed and let the citizen patrol pass, but it had been five minutes of this obnoxiousness. There was also the possibility, however distant, that it could be Riley, or or his only his girlfriend, or ex-girlfriend Riley, could knock that violently. He was careful not to get his hopes up about the possibility that she could be back, if only to yell at him some more. Still, he was disappointed when he reached the foyer of Miss Garcia's house, opened the door, and saw who he had been 99% sure was at the door. Oh, uh, um, hi, Jim. Wexler. Didn't know you were here. I was about to give up. Uh Uh-huh. Jim, rubbing the crust out of his eyes, holding onto the door for balance. What do you want? Oh, you know, I'm just making my rounds, making sure all is well. Uh, Didn't know you and Riley were still staying here. Just me. Oh, yeah? You're not with Riley no more? Jim frowned. Leland Wexler was still as fidgety as he had been in high school. The same skinny dork who used to trip and stumble his way through the halls with button-down shirts tucked into pants that rode high over his hips, and a perpetual sign stuck to his back saying, Homo. Now, here he was, six years later, same geek, different clothes. "Uh, Anyway, Wexler said, I just seen that Miss Garcia's car wasn't parked out front. Didn't know if she had gone out of town, because, you know, if she had gone out of town, I'd need to make a note of it. That's standard procedure, you know, keep track of the folks who were gone. Did you see my car parked around back? Uh, No, I guess I didn't think to look. You'd make a great police officer, Wexler. Yeah, Wexler said. You think so? Oh, yeah. Look, Miss Garcia's gone out of town to see her sister in Gulf Shores. But I'm staying here. You know that because my car is parked out back. Maybe look back there next time before you beat the hell out of the door and wake me up. Uh, All right, Jim. We'll slam. Jim began to walk back down the stairs, but his eyes landed on Riley's box first full of her little knickknacks, her CDs and records and fashion magazines, and books by Mary Higgins Clark, the last remaining evidence of her ever living there. He had thrown it by the door a whole week ago, Riley saying she didn't want to pick it up from him directly, and instead of coming around back of the house to the basement apartment, she would just come to the front and get it from Miss Garcia. But now, Jim figured, Riley had no idea Miss Garcia wouldn't be there to meet her, and she'd have to deal with him anyway. Did he want to deal with her? Halfway to his car down the sidewalk, Leland Wexler turned back to Miss Garcia's front door when he heard it opening and saw Jim Keating, thinking he had something more to say to him. But no, Jim just dropped a cardboard box full of stuff on the welcome mat and slammed the door shut once more. Folks are so cranky these days, Wexler thought. It was another long day of waiting, It seemed to be all Jim had done this summer, was wait. He waited for something to pull him out of bed. The dogs barking outside, or the pull starting of lawnmowers in the neighbor's yard, or the hellish knocking of the nerd patrol in the front door. He waited for something to happen to him. He waited for the phone to ring, and on it one of the numerous principals from one of the numerous high schools he had put an application into, telling him they had a job for him in the fall. He waited for the mail to come each day, and in it a fat envelope from the university telling him his graduate school application had been gladly accepted. And until any of that happened, he waited for Riley, thinking she'd be back, and she'd forgiven herself and had finally decided to accept him without conditions. That Wednesday, he waited, just as he always did that she had left, waited, and slacked. After he walked back down the stairs from dealing with Wexler, He spent another half hour on the couch he'd been sleeping on since she'd left, drinking his coffee and watching the bottom half of The Price is Right. Then he flipped it to the afternoon court shows just to have some ambience while he made SpaghettiOs and drank a Coke and read his Stephen King novel. He kept the TV on while he waited and slacked around the apartment through the afternoon. Around three, he dog-eared the paperback and switched to beer, twisting the cap off his first rolling rock of the day as the talk shows began and using his shirt as a makeshift plate for potato chips, while the rednecks quarreled over whose baby was who, and he spun cards around in his hand, perfecting the one card trick he could kind of do 
where you palm a card and make it like it disappeared. The chip grease on his hand made it hard, though, so he stopped doing the trick and just sort of threw the cards around the room in a kind of impromptu game of skee-ball, wringing them in shoes and hats, dirty plates and cups with lukewarm coffee still in them. At five, when the news came on and the sun began its slow descent, he took the party outside, and he sat in the back driveway reading his new issue of Fangoria that had come in the mail that day. It was no acceptance letter to grad school, but it due until the letter got here. He just sat there and read, and he listened to drive-time radio, and cooled his feet in an inflatable baby pool he'd found last summer stashed away in Miss Garcia's basement. When the bugs got too much, and no amount of bug spray could keep them at bay, Jim moved inside and parked himself back on the couch, where the primetime shows were starting, all of them reruns and hiatus. He ordered a pizza for dinner, putting it on his credit card, which he treated like a bottomless pit these days. When the pizza guy knocked on the front door and he walked up the stairs to pick it up, he saw that Riley's knickknacks were still there, and he looked up to the sky and wondered if it would rain that night. Clouds moving in, he brought the box back in with the pizza. He began to doze off on the couch around 11, like he had done the night before and the night before that. In a buzz of grease and alcohol, the late-night talk show host and reruns doing their mindless patter with celebrities, grilling them about their diets and exercise regimens, and how it was to work with this actress or that director on some movie that had come out months ago and was now long gone from the multiplexes. A few times he snapped awake, thinking he had heard the door upstairs thump open and footsteps creeping down the stairs. No way, he thought groggily. There was no one in the house but him. And if it was Riley, she wouldn't come down the stairs, since she wasn't up for seeing him these days. If she was up for seeing him, she'd come in through the apartment door, like she always did. Riley, in her faded Neil Young shirt she always wore, in her cut-off shorts, in her tragic expression... She would come through the door and sit on the couch with him and tell him what had happened was all wrong, and she'd grab a slice of the cold pizza and a beer out of the fridge, and it would all be normal again. He, drink, he drifted off thinking this could all still happen, and happen any minute, and he waited for her as the digital clock on top of the TV blinked 11.15, 11.16, and then nothing at all. A scream woke him up a scream in the distorted strum of a guitar. It came like a thunderclap without the courtesy of lightning, and Jim felt his body jerk up on the couch. Through the cloud of his vision, he saw a man in black and white, electric guitar strapped around his shoulder. It seemed off for a stockbroker, which is what he looked like in his business suit and tie. He was up on a stage of some kind, not a big concert stage, but one like in a high school where they combined the gym and auditorium, a gymtorium. He didn't seem to be singing anything or doing a concert, though. It was more like preaching, excitable Pentecostal preaching. He was strumming, but mostly shouting and strumming between the shouts, like the strums emphasized a new point he was about to make. And he was surrounded by screaming black and white people, some of them writhing and convulsing, taking him in with the whole of their bodies. Some of them jumped on stage. And what was weird was that while some of the stage jumpers were girls like you would expect with a guy in an electric guitar, some were men, grown-ass men. They tore at his suit and fought amongst each other to touch his guitar. He was some kind of a messiah. And there was some odd hallucinogenic filter on this movie, making the images twirl around at odd times, like whoever made this movie wanted to hypnotize the viewer into going along with this rock star messiah also. Or maybe it was just in Jim's blurry vision, the blue light streaming from the TV, punching his brain. Whatever it was, it gave him a headache, and in a fast act of self-preservation, he reached for the remote, wet with grease from lying in the pizza box all night, and flipped the damn thing off. He squinted at the clock on top of the TV. 207, 208, nothing. Next day, in the early afternoon... Jim drove to Stanton Street and walked into the Video Street video store, where he was hardly surprised to find Maureen behind the counter in her usual argument with a customer who should have known better than to pretend he knew more than she did. How dare you walk in my store spouting this nonsense, she was yelling. You even pay attention when you watch movies? 
I'm just not sure what you're saying, the customer said. Jim saw he was sheepish and tense. Let me break it down for you, okay? Does she ever express sorrow for any of them? I'm not sure. No, I don't think. When you're sitting around, when they're sitting around telling each other why they're all there and bearing their souls, does she do the same? Um, no. Does she make up the girl at the end in her own image rather than accepting her for the basket case that she is? The customer was silent. Hells no, she doesn't do any of that shit. It's because Molly Ringwald is the villain of the breakfast club. Jesus, how do you not know this? You probably can't even do the maze puzzle on the back of a stupid cereal box. Oh, hey, Jim. Maureen's attention switched within one breath to him as he wandered the store and waited for her to finish her rant. Have a look around, all right? I'll be with you in a minute, right after I'm done with this Philistine. Jim flashed an okay with his fingers. It, it had been a while since he'd been in, but it was nice to see some things never changed. The windows were all blacked out with movie posters and video company swag, making the store a dim netherworld jungle of shelves and end caps, floor-to-ceiling tapes and other merchandise, 3D standing posters for movies, demented action figures for Predator, Alien, and others by the Todd McFarlane ilk. Candy, previously viewed tapes for sale. There was even some rare memorabilia, such as a poster of Walking Tall, signed by Buford Pusser himself, Mr. Joe Don Baker. Look, kid, Marine was finishing. I can't even talk to you anymore. Take this and come back when you're woke. Jim didn't have to look to know what Maureen was giving the poor guy, which was a copy of her zine, Movie Mad and Psychotic. This place, she said, is a church, and this is your Bible. Now go. But I wanted to rent some. Go, vanish. The bell dinged, and the student was gone. You were a little hard on him, Jim said. Oh, relax. He's knows, he knows it's all in good fun, Maureen said. How's Riley? I haven't seen her around in a while. Riley's Riley, Jim said, leaning on the counter and flipping through the latest issue of Movie Mad and Psychotic. When Maureen had placed a box, which, which Maureen had placed a box of in front of the cash register. Oh, yeah? Maureen let the thought go. Then she struck a pose for Jim in the cracked sunlight. You like my hair? Sure, it's, um, very blue. You think so? I was going for a sort of violet Beauregard chic. It's cool, Jim said, and put the zine down. Hey, I'm wondering if you know about a movie. I don't know the title or basically anything about it, but maybe you can shoot. Um, there's like this guy in it. A guy, Maureen laughed. The movie has a guy in it. Let me go look at the movies with guy genre rack. See what I can find. Honestly, Jim, you're better than that. I appreciate that. But seriously, this guy was like in a suit, like he was a businessman and he had a guitar and he was doing this like wild concert for a bunch of people. Do you know who played him? No, but it was a black and white film, maybe the 60s, super grainy. And he had this like demented expression on his face, like he was trying to seduce the crowd or something. Hmm. Marine said, mulling it over. That's the job of a rock star, I guess. Yeah, but I don't think he was a rock star. He was like more of like a preacher. Anyway, I was half asleep when this movie came on Channel 6 last night, and I just can't get it out of my head. I'm familiar with that, Maureen said. My dad used to call them 2 a.m. movies. So it sounds like maybe it was a low budget, definitely independent, and probably public domain, since those are the kinds of movies they show late at night on Channel 6. Did you check the guide? Maureen began for the guide, but Jim stopped her. Yeah, I checked it. There was nothing there. It just said paid programming. Really? That's unusual. Must have been a screw-up in the schedule. Yeah, maybe, Jim said. So, do you know this movie? No, you didn't give me enough information. Oh, come on, Maureen, really? It's a cheap movie from the 60s. I mean, look, this whole zine you put out this month is dedicated to melt movies. Obscure stuff. Tough luck, man, Maureen said. Normally I can tell you based on the first syllable of the description, but what you told me, it's just not enough. I think you found my kryptonite. Yeah, Jim deezed off the counter and went for the door. But I'll tell you who might be able to help, Maureen said. And Jim per turned back to her. There's this guy who lives out on 78. That's pretty much all he does as it live out there in his house, actually. He never leaves it. Really? How can he help me? All he does all day is tape TV. He works for these watchdog groups who police false advertising, helping people who get ripped off. He specializes in televangelists. I pretty dear, damn near guarantee you that if anybody in Viscaga caught this flick other than you, Sully did. And he's got a tape of it. 
if he never leaves his place, how do you know him? He's a tape connoisseur. He loves collecting weird videos from all over, stuff made for special audiences that you and I will never see in the normal course of our boring lives. He puts them all together in compilation tapes and gives us to gives them to us for a share of the rentals. The wasteoids go crazy for him. Jim followed Maureen's pointed finger to a rack on the wall. Videotapes with homemade covers under a banner dubbed in magic marker, Sully's Video Weird. The labels on the tape were as diverse as Fast Food Training Volume 4 to City Planning and Town Hall Freak 2 and News Anchor Assholes Season 10. Is he okay with me just showing up? Oh yeah, he's cool. I'll call him and tell him you're on your way. Marine wrote Sully's address on the back of a rhino bumper sticker, and before Jim dinged the bell on his way out, she stopped him. Only thing is, you can't go empty-handed, and she took a pack of Twizzlers off the candy rack and tossed it to him. Jim regarded it, confused. Well, come on, man, that'll be three bucks. Cough it up. It took Jim five goes at the starter before his engine finally turned. Damn Dodge. Riley's uncle had sold the Dodge to him for practically nothing last summer, and every time he got behind the wheel, he knew why. Pulling out of the parking lot of the Video Street video store, Jim wondered if, even back then, last summer, Riley's family had been telling her he was no good and had set out to sabotage him in backhand ways, such as selling him an automotive POS with an ignition on life support and an AC that was DOA. Now, cruising down Stanton Street, he cranked the windows down, tried to go as fast as possible to catch a little air, one hand on the wheel and one hand adjusting the battery-powered fan from Walmart, which mounted limply on the vent. Sitting alone in the outside pavilion at Fast Burger, Leland Wexler had just finished a satisfying burger and fries at a picnic table by himself and decided to spend the last few minutes of his break from Citizen Patrol reading his new book, a haunted house mystery by a lady author named Mary Higgins Clark. As he cracked open the book, he was disturbed by the loud, distorted vibrations coming from somebody's car speaker. He looked up and saw that it was Jim Keating, his windows down, free as a bird, banging his head along with the radio. He thought, some people just don't have no respect for peace and quiet these days. Jim was stopped at a red light, thinking about the weird direction his day was going. He was heading out to see a shut-in about a strange movie he'd only caught five seconds of at 2 a.m. Better than yesterday, and the day before that, he figured. Good to take a break from manic morons trying to guess how much a toaster oven cost. So he was sitting there, music coming from the speakers, waiting for the light to change. The radio had also broken about a month after Riley's uncle had sold him the car, so now he relied on his old disc man, which he had plugged into the tape deck using a tape jack, and he played the same CD on repeat, a mix of music from his senior year in high school. Of course, the songs had lost all meaning. He had heard them too much and barely noticed them anymore. Still, he couldn't help but grip the top of his window and beat his fingers in time. Is that Starship? He heard a voice next to him scream. He turned his head and saw a girl staring at him from the next car. She was some familiar face, yelling from the passenger seat. He knew her name, or had once known it. Yeah, Jim said, I guess it is. Awesome, that song's bitchin'. Jim just smiled and looked back at the light, still red. You remember me? She said. Yeah, sure I do, Jim lied. Come on, Pratt High, I was a sophomore when you were a senior. Shauna Glasgow? Oh, right. Now Jim did remember her, or at least her name. Hey, Shauna, yeah, I guess it's been a few years. I still had my braces on back then, but I'm all grown up now. She flashed her teeth at him, and Jim gave her a thumbs up. Where are you heading? I'm just out driving, heading out to meet somebody, actually. Are you going down by Huntington Meadows? Uh, no, not really. You think you can give me a ride home? The jerk I'm with doesn't think I'm worth the time. Jim considered this for a moment, and thought of a nice way to turn her down. While in the lane next to him, Shauna fought her driver's hands off her blouse, and looked back at Jim with desperate begging eyes. I'm not going to get you in trouble, am I, Shauna? Jim said. Don't worry, I can handle it. All right, then. Shauna cheered and got out. Jim could feel the other driver's eyes on him, cold and steely on top of a Mack truck body. Jim just looked right back while Shauna got in next to him. Bitchin', she said again, and then sang along to the chorus of Jane as the light went green and they took off into the country. 
Hey, quit hogging, guy, Shauna said, at first Jim not knowing what she meant, but then seeing her eyes on the battery fan. Oh, sorry, Jim said, and took the fan off the vent. She took it and held it to her face, ran it along her thick brown hair. She put her feet up on the dash and hung her head halfway out the window, feeling the passing air. So what have you been up to since high school? Working mostly, she said. The shoe stampede sucks. Is that where you work, Jim said, at the shoe stampede? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of all right. You get a discount. Some of the stuff's designer and it's real good, but mostly you just sit around all day helping these disgusting people put shoes on their feet. You wouldn't believe how folks take care of their feet. I mean, it's really disgusting. They got corns and everything. I'll bet. It's just like you want to tell them, stop, take care of your feet. The feet are where the body starts, which pretty much to me means they're where the soul starts. If you don't take care of your feet, you don't take care of your soul. You get me? I never thought of it that way. To me, Shauna said, it's the only way to think about it. Jim and Shauna took Stanton Street out of town, watched the shops and the neighborhoods drift away until there was just open country, vast endless fields and jungles of pine trees. When they came to a lonely intersection where the road crossed 78, Jim realized Soli's place was only a few minutes away, and a certain anticipation had begun to build within him, almost like his heart was beating faster with every mile he ticked off. He filled Shauna in on the particulars of his mission, and asked her if she wouldn't mind making the quick detour. "'You're not dragging me out into some kind of a bear trap,' Shauna said. "'I already got one asshole, you know. I don't need another.' What? Jim said, shocked. No, nothing like that. Because, you know, I don't know what you've been up to since high school. You could have been out there traveling across America murdering hitchhikers, for all I know. That's insane. Anyway, you got in the car with me. Look who's victim blaming all of a sudden. Well, for all I know, you could be directing me out to the middle of nowhere to murder me. For all you know, Shauna repeated. Jim was silent, letting Steve Perry on his mixtape do all the talking for a minute. Finally, Shauna looked out at the road. Let's just take this one step at a time. Very well, Shauna Glasgow. Jim turned on 78 and found Sully's house about a mile past the Cosmic Twin Drive-In, at the end of a long, broken road with a serious pothole problem. Fearing for his car's safety, he navigated slowly down the winding path, along a mass of overgrown weeds and privet, and rolling his windows up for fear that snakes might jump in at him without notice. Sometimes they did that. Standing at the door, Shauna next to him in the heat, holding the battery fan against herself, Jim rang the doorbell, and they heard the first few notes of the Jetsons' theme ding back at them. Ding, 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 ding. After a moment, the door creaked open, and a heavyset man in shorts, flip-flops, and a graying beard that was shedding on his black Huckleberry Hound t-shirt stood there, looking at them. Yes, he said. Sully, Jim said. I'm Jim Keating. Maureen at the video store should have called about me. Yeah, she did, Sully said, then lingered. Anyway, I was hoping I could talk to you about a movie you may have taped last night. I tape a lot of movies. Yeah, but this one came on at 2 a.m. on Channel 6. Maybe you could just check. Can you just let us in, dude? Shauna said. It's like 100 degrees out here. Who is this? Sully said, looking her over. Oh, this is Shauna. She's cool. Look, I brought you Twizzlers. Jim held up the bag of licorice sticks, which Sully eyed and instinctively licked his lips. Then he took them from Jim and opened the door. Sully's house made the Video Street video store look like Midsummer in the Netherlands, or Hannibal Lecter's storage locker in Silence of the Lambs look like a quaint antique shop. It was a dark, gonzo maze of strange worldly trinkets and childhood collectibles. Jim saw shrunken heads dangling from a nail on the wall, hanging over a poster of James Wells' Frankenstein. He saw toys from all eras, unwrapped and still in their pristine boxes, and sitting inside a row of humidors the size of grandfather clocks. There were children's practice guitars and miniature drum sets and other random instruments for the developing strewn about. He saw lunch boxes from long ago, the Lone Ranger lost in space, Rocky and Bullwinkle, piled haphazardly on top of a table. It was like the mess had happened accidentally, and over a number of years, and perhaps after a number of abductions, still unsolved, and he had yet to get around to burying this evidence in the backyard. Maybe, Jim realized, 
he can no longer guarantee Shauna's safety after all. Pardon the darkness, Sully said to them as they walked through his living room, careful not to trip on any of his floor-to-ceiling hoarder's nest. The glare is really bad on the TV, so I have to make it dark in here. Always dark. Popping the Twizzlers in his mouth in strands of two and three, Sully led them into a back bedroom where his TVs were, stacks of them, running along metal shelves on all four corners, all turned on and with the sound off. Jim stood at the threshold of the door, stunned. It was like every day of the last three weeks since Riley had left on Mescalin. There were the game shows and midday news, the injury lawyer commercials and non-step ads for Colonial Pen with Alex Trebek, the redneck talk shows where the trash people lunged at each other. On one TV, Matlock stood over a witness in the witness box, smiling his mischievous grin and showing that he had just gotten his man. Jim thought it must almost be three. Beautiful, ain't it? Sully said. Psychorama, Shauna said under her breath. It's not psychotic, he snapped. It's my job. What do you do all day? I guess you got a point, Mr. Video Man. So 2 a.m. on Channel 6, Sully said, rifling through a tall, neat stack of tapes on the table in the corner. It was, Jim noted, probably the only thing that was organized in the whole damn place. Yeah, it was this movie with a guy who was some kind of a preacher, but he had a guitar and was playing rock music. It was black and white, maybe from the 60s. Did you check the guide? Of course I checked the guide. What do you think? Sally paused, and so did Shauna, alarmed at the sudden tension in Jim's voice. I'm sorry, he told them. It's just the first thing you do when you see something on TV you don't know. You check the guide. You're the second person to ask me. Sully found the tape he was looking for. It had a label with a coded number Jim couldn't see. He popped it into a free VCR on the table, and the TV on top flickered to life with the image of the nightly newscast from last night. Each night, Sully said, the tape starts at 10, then it goes on through 5 a.m. before the second TV picks up the morning shift. So if it was on last night, as you say, it should be here. Sully fast-forwarded through the news, then the talk shows with the trivial celebrities selling their movies and thigh masters. Jim could feel his pulse racing faster as he and Sully waited in the silence, which was loud. The humming of the wall-to-wall VCRs below each TV was deafening, a shrill electronic chorus of tapes starting and stopping, the mechanisms inside catching the tape and running it through the heads. Listen to them, Sully said, smiling. The children of the night. How do you stand it, Jim said. It's just like any job. You do it long enough, you can stand anything. Sometimes, if you listen close enough, you can hear them playing your favorite tunes. Listen. Jim listened. What music? It was just a bunch of screeching and whirring. But Sully's grimace broadened. Lola, he sang, looking at him. Lola, Lola, Lola. Do you hear it? Is that 2 a.m. yet? The video vampire stopped his concert and looked back at the TV, compared the time code with his wristwatch. That is? He stopped the tape. After a second of the tracking adjusting, the image straightened and Jim saw a preacher all right, but not the preacher with the business suit and the electric guitar he had expected. Rather, the man on the TV had an awful comb-over wig and sat cross-legged with a Bible on his lap, an offering plate next to him, and a 1-900 number superimposed below him. He spoke into the camera about calling into the station right now as if your eternal life depended on it. Because it does. That it? No, it's not. What do you mean it's not? That's a preacher. I see this dude a lot, Sully said. He, sees, he sells old people water he says has healing powers. Yeah, but it's not him. It's not the guy. It's not the movie. Jim calmed himself. You're sure that's Channel 6? Oh, yeah, Sully said. Got a foolproof system. Then how can... I'll tell you what probably happened, Sully said. If you say that you were half awake, then you may have confused something that you saw in real life with a dream. Trust me, I'm up all day and night with the TV going. It happens. You start feeling like a zombie after a while. They even got a name for it. It's called DRC. DRC? Dream Reality Confusion. Yeah, but I saw this. I know I saw it. It wasn't a, holy hell! Jim and Sully looked out of the room suddenly, toward a voice that screamed down the hall. They raced out of the TV room to find Shauna at the entrance to another bedroom, standing stock still in shock. 
Jim saw what had gotten her, a room that had been decorated to resemble a child's bedroom of the 1950s. They were looking at shelves of Mr. Potato Head toys and Tinker Toy structures, howdy duty puppets with lifeless smiles, hanging from cowboy-themed wallpaper of pistols and lassos. The bed was made up immaculately with a bedspread of the Lone Ranger and matching pillows. This, Shauna said, is maybe the creepiest thing I've ever seen. What do you know, Sully said. I thought you saw a snake in here or something. Jeez. Why would an adult man have a bedroom like this? She whispered to Jim. Unless he's got some kid chained up in the basement. It's a hobby, Sully said, pacing the room to make sure all was in place. You didn't touch anything, did you? What's the hobby, Jim said. I'm recreating my childhood bedroom. Been working on it for years. My mother threw all my stuff out, all my old stuff out years ago, that hag. So I've been recollecting it, going to the ends of the earth. Everything is as I remember it. This ch- toy chest right here? Sully pointed to a giant plastic football stuffed with toys and into its hollow center. The on- they only manufactured this thing for one year, 1954, when I was five years old. You know how long it took me to find that? How long? Ten years it took me. I had to drive all the way to Fairbanks, Alaska. This is really impressive, Jim said, and he felt Shauna tugging on his shirt, signaling him that it was probably time to go. I don't get it, though. You spend years collecting stuff from your childhood, all the stuff in your house. What's the appeal? Or why run from stuff that made you happy? With that, Sully stepped past them, his inspection complete, and let them follow him back down the hall. Just don't wander off anywhere else, okay? Sully made sure she wouldn't, because the next thing they knew, he was opening the door for him, the sunlight hitting them like a blast of a neutron bomb. You want my honest opinion, Sully was saying as he ushered them outside. If what you saw on TV last night actually happened, it was probably a hacker. You know these guys that get into the video feeds, they play their own tapes just to mess with people? The antennas beam them out. Some people see them, some people don't. If it wasn't a dream, then a hacker's what it was. Any idea how I can find them? Sully snorted. <laughs> These people are ghosts. Good luck, but the tape's out there somewhere. You look for something long enough, you'll find it. Just ask that toy chest, Shauna said. Sully frowned at this. This time, it took Jim six goes to, to turn the starter, to which Shauna balked and opined that they were now, officially, in a horror movie. He was silent most of the way to her house, biting his ne- nails and thinking about next steps, or if there should even be next steps. When he pulled up to her driveway in Huntington Meadows, he kept the engine running for fear of having to go through the drama of starting it again. She waited a minute before getting out of the car. You're a really odd person, she said to him. Yeah, I guess I am. You want to come in? My mom's here, but she's pretty much out of it this time of day. I can pour you some lemonade. I spike it with tequila. No, that's okay, Jim said, seeing the bad idea that it probably was. Uh, Thanks, though. Shauna shrugged. Your loss. Thanks for the ride. I hope you find your video. That guy was weird, but I hope you find it. She opened the door and got out. Jim wondered what Sully being weird and him finding the video had to do with one another. He watched her go through the windshield of grime and bug guts and shifted into drive. Before taking off, he saw her do a cartwheel in the grass for him. When she completed her full perfect rotation, she gave him a bow He smiled back at her, and he remembered, for the first time, Shauna. She had been a sophomore when he was a senior, and a freshman when he was a junior. Shauna, the peppy cheerleader always surrounded, never walking alone. She was now a floor clerk at the shoe stampede. continue that story next week here in the Midnight Citizen Show we will continue that story next week on the Midnight Citizen Show 
need some water. <laughs> Fairly long one. If you're still around, thanks for listening. I'll go into the behind the scenes of that story a little bit in the post show in just a minute. So you can definitely catch it. If you were listening in the future and not on the live stream. From Birmingham, Alabama, this has been the Midnight Citizen Show. Thank you so much for joining tonight. You can catch me once again at MikeBooty.com slash the Midnight Citizen. I will uh, be posting there from now on, but I will also be posting on my brother network with all my podcasting brothers over there from other podcasting mothers, the Onsug, O-N-S-U-G dot com, the Overnight Scape Underground. I love those guys. And I am in the process, by the way, of getting a new podcasting feed set up, so I will have my own uh, new podcast feed set up here in the next uh, week or so. Be looking for it to download on the podcasting app of your choice. If you have any comments, suggestions, complaints, anything at all, please feel free to drop me a line at mikebooty at gmail.com. Please do. I used to have a mic at midnight, mic at midnightcitizen.com email address, but uh, it stopped updating. Something happened to it. I don't know what, uh, but apparently I was like getting emails from people on my personal email address, mikebooty at gmail. And um, they were saying like, did you ever get that thing I sent you? <laughs> Guess I didn't. So check me out there. Till next time. Keep your eyes open. Man.